how much more growth are we going to see with a full range of motion versus with partials? Do we think full range of motion will win or do we think partials will win? Whoever guesses closer to the final result in terms of how much more percentage growth we see will get $500. So let's make our predictions and the review. So, Dr. Wolf and I made a bet at the end of our New York trip for our new study on full ROM versus lengthened partials for muscle growth in trained participants. But let's rewind a second. The year is 2023 and good friend and fellow doctor, Milo Wolf, who was doing his PhD on range of motion at the time, publishes his PhD literature review titled Partial versus Full Range of Motion Resistance Training, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. Up until that point, the literature showed that a full range of motion is the clear winner when it comes to hypertrophy, and that's what also Milo's literature review showed. But Mr. Milo at the time had an idea. He was like, let's also run a sub-analysis looking at whether muscle length influences the results of the partial range of motion condition. And lo and behold, when looking specifically at the influence of muscle length in the partial range of motion condition, Partials at long muscle lengths actually resulted in more hypertrophy than a full range of motion. Lengthened partials, a term coined by Milo, I think, put some respect on his name regardless, started completely taking over our space. Lengthened partials. Lengthened partials have been all the rage. Lengthened partials. Lengthened partials. Lengthened partials like some people on YouTube are doing. The hype was real. Everyone started talking about the stretch and lengthened partials. But with that level of hype comes controversy, knee-jerk reactions, strawman claims, anti-science BS, uh, as well as valid criticisms of the literature that unfortunately get buried in the drama and troll comments. But what was actually claimed that spurred so much controversy? Well, the claim was that performing lengthened partials may result in five to 10% more hypertrophy than exclusively performing a full range of motion. Yes, the evidence at the time was nowhere near conclusive, like with many things in our field. Yes, more research was needed, but training at long muscle lengths, regardless of whether that meant doing exclusively partials, consistently appeared to be important for hypertrophy, with more studies coming out after that meta-analysis showing that the stretch seems to be quite important for muscle growth in general. On the contrary, evidence pro a full range of motion, pro including that shortened position in your training, was just not there. There was no study that showed that doing things with a full range of motion was better than just doing length and partials. Yes, there wasn't much, but the little bit we had showed that length and partials are at worst as good as a full range of motion for hypertrophy, if not better. And yes, even though the data was not conclusive, we are talking about a muscle growth optimization niche here. The people that consume this sort of content enjoy looking at the details and doing things that may get them that extra five to 10%. For the majority of people that don't care about our niche, this didn't change anything in their lives. And it's likely that they may have heard a few things here and there, but didn't really care as much. Still, there were claims that the emphasis on the stretch and length and training was overstated, that it wasn't as important as people made it to be, that length and training definitely only worked in beginner and probably only in the muscle groups that have been studied, like the quads and the calves versus like the biceps and triceps. And in general, there was a lot of doubt, which is healthy, but at the same time, it did get a bit too toxic at times. However, it is true that the direct research on lengthened partials versus the full range of motion, especially as you would do it in practice, in trained participants and more specifically in the upper body musculature were non-existent at the time. Although partials at long muscle lengths seemed very promising for those looking to absolutely maximize gains, things were still far from conclusive. So we decided that it was the perfect time to run a study looking exactly at that. Partials at long muscle lengths versus a full range of motion in trained participants in the upper body musculature. But when I say we, I don't mean Milo and myself. I mean us at the Applied Muscle Development Lab in New York City, more specifically at Lehman College. In addition to the A team, AKA the MD lab, we also had help from the YouTube overlord, Jeff Nibbard who not only funded the study, but also 
contributed in its creation and obviously the write-up afterwards and so on and so forth. Enough yapping. Enter Wolf et al. 2024. Rock music. That's how you play rock music. And just like that, we're in the Applied Muscle Development Lab here in New York City at Lehman College. This is the first study to actually look at whether a full range of motion is better, the same, worse than lengthened partials in trained individuals. In general, this is the first study to actually explore whether there is something to lengthen partials for trained individuals and the upper body musculature specifically. We're looking at the biceps and the triceps and we're doing plenty of upper body work for chest, back, and obviously direct bicep and tricep work. The study is eight weeks long, and in those trained participants, one of their arms will be trained using a full range of motion and the other using a partial range of motion. That essentially allows us to control for factors like nutrition, sleep, overall fatigue, stress, and so on and so forth. So yeah, the stakes, much like myself, were pretty high. So to make things interesting between us, we decided to make a friendly bet at the very last day of us being in New York City after we were done with any sort of involvement in the study itself. How much more growth are we going to see with a full range of motion versus with partials? Do we think full range of motion will win or do we think partials will win? Whoever guesses closer to the final result in terms of how much more percentage growth we see we'll get $500. So, let's make our predictions and the reveal. Three, two, one. Whoa! All right. Dr. Pack, plus 5%. Very conservative prediction. I'm gonna go plus 30%. <laughs> Listen, my, uh, my rationalization here. In most of the comparisons of length and partials and full range of motion, we often observe up to twice as much growth. Granted, that is in beginners. However, we're talking about plus 100% growth. I think we'll at least see 30, 50% more growth. And I knew the good Dr. Pack here would go more conservative. So I decided, let me go ahead and skew on the upper end. Why 5%? So I agree with Dr. Milo Wolf here and what he said, but we are dealing with trained participants and in this study, a relatively trained cohort, just eight weeks and They've been training extremely hard for the full range of motion condition as well, going to failure, and sometimes because they're told to attempt one more rep just to ensure they're at failure, slightly beyond failure. So if this was 16 weeks, I'd be closer to that. However, given the length and the training status of the participants, and because it's difficult to see a ton of muscle growth in that time, I'm gonna go conservative with a 5%. So no. essentially no difference with a slight thing for length and partials. I'll see you soon. Five Hana, baby, let's see. Wait a second, Dr. Pack. I hear you saying, how the hell can we trust a study that is spearheaded by Dr. Langton Parcels himself, AKA Milo? Well, I'll let fellow AMD lab researcher and friend Alec Pinheiro, who was responsible for overseeing data collection in NYC, explain the steps we took to actually reduce bias. Yeah, so like any studies that we run here, uh, we take a few steps to make sure that there's no bias um, or as little bias as possible in the way that we're training and collecting data. Firstly, we have a range of RAs, experienced researchers who are training subjects. So throughout the study, each participant is going to be trained by, you know, anywhere from three to 10 different people who are all going through the same cues, all holding the same standards, but ultimately they get exposure to, to different people and you're not having the same person that can influence things over and over. That's one. A second part is on the end of the actual uh, data collection. So the ultrasound technician who takes measurements pre and post is completely blinded to uh, the measurements and the assignment of groups. They don't know which limb, in this case, uh, was doing the length and partials, which limb was doing the full range of motion. So when the participants come in, they take the objective measurements without any knowledge that could influence the way that they, you know, move the cursor one way or the other. Um, they're doing it as straight up and down as possible. And then finally, so we've trained the participants 
we've collected the data. When the data is analyzed, the statistician doesn't actually know which data points align with which subject, right? They just get the information and they analyze it blinded before returning the results. And so that's a way kind of throughout the whole process that, uh, that we make sure that there's as little bias as possible in every step of the way. What's nice about this project specifically is that we're including video footage, right? We've actually recorded participants anonymized, um, but real participants from the study doing both the partials and the full range of motion. I think it's gonna be a great opportunity for people to actually see kind of a peek behind the curtain, what goes on in these studies. If you want a more in-depth video on the study, check out Milo's video where he breaks down the methods, etc., in much more detail. But what did the study actually find? <laughs> Length and partials resulted in the same growth as a full range of motion with a stretch emphasis. So what does this mean? Is this the end of length and partials? <laughs> it's been a few weeks since the results of the study came out. Uh, we've completely lost Milo. I haven't heard from him since, uh, but I've heard that he might be chilling somewhere around here behind this gym. Milo, Paul rerun the analysis. Length and partials won. Is that us? All right then, here's the money, bitch boy. Where's the actual money? What money? Where's the money? <laughs> well, in my opinion, no, quite the opposite actually. Even though length and partials did not result in greater hypertrophy than a full range of motion, they also did not result in less hypertrophy. Additionally, the full range of motion condition did bias the stretch by pausing in the stretch position and all sets were taken to true failure, meaning to the point where participants were trying to do another full range of motion rep and they weren't getting one more. I'm not talking about volitional failure or fatigue failure or whatever weird definition has been used in the past. The results, at least in my humble opinion, further highlight the importance of emphasizing the stretch and training in the stretch position. Additionally, as it stands, length and training resulted in greater muscle growth than shortened training, when we look at the literature just separating the two, and the totality of the current literature still supports length and partials either being equal or slightly better than a full range of motion. So this study didn't push things towards the full range of motion side, as some have claimed in trained individuals, but rather it showed that, hey, as long as you're getting the stretch and there's an emphasis there, doing that extra bit at the end doesn't really seem to be giving you much more, if anything more. In reality, this study further highlights that as long as you're ticking a few basic boxes, training for muscle growth is pretty straightforward. Namely, emphasize the stretch, train close or to failure, do enough training volume, rest for about a minute plus, perform a variety of exercises per muscle group, and eat plenty of protein in a slight calorie surplus if you want to maximize gains. That is literally it. And the rest is just icing on the cake, if that. And there you have it. A full range of motion with a stretch emphasis seems to be as good as just doing length and partials for muscle growth in trained individuals. Terms and conditions apply, obviously. This is not the end of this research. This is not the final study that answers all questions. Obviously, we need more research, but as it stands, that little mountain of evidence that is slowly growing for length and training just received another little addition. So overall, the current literature still shows that length and partials are either equal or slightly superior than a full range of motion. Emphasize the stretch, don't overthink this. See you guys next time. Bye.